John McKibben is going to lead us in prayer. I suspect if I ask everyone here tonight to come up with points for prayer, for intercession, we might be here overnight. So I've picked about six different areas that we might just specifically think about tonight. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we have enjoyed worship with you already today in this place. And we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for the reminder that Sam gave to us this morning from Nehemiah that you are a great and an awesome God who frustrates those who plot against us, our enemies in ministry. And Father, we thank you that uh, that uh, passage of scripture that we studied told us of how your wall was finished in Jerusalem and how people went to work and rebuild after being stopped. So as we seek to minister for you also, help us to hear the sound of the trumpet. And if we haven't joined in or we have backed off recently, help us to join in and stay sharp and keep going and to be alert as we seek to serve you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity yesterday for the elders of our church to enjoy a retreat day when we could meditate and reflect in your presence and consider intimacy with you, which is a key to godly leadership. Father, we pray for our elders. And help us to support them as they seek to serve this congregation in your strength. May our leadership be strong. We pray especially for our chief elder, our pastor. We thank you for Frank's leadership. And we pray at the beginning of a new church year that you would be with him and us as we seek to uh, witness to the love of Jesus Christ and to demonstrate again that we are based in the Bible, passionate about people, and we're centered in Christ and we're relevant in this day and age. Father, we thank you for the initiative that Michael brought to us this morning with D Ship for Boys and Girls. We thank you for all our youth organizations, Merge and Merge Extend, for the Boys Brigade and the Guides and other organizations. We thank you for the Mad Weekend coming up. We thank you for Michael and Petra's enthusiasm. We thank you for bringing them to us, and we pray that you'll bless them. And those who, in teenage years, have accepted leadership in our congregation, we bless you for them. Our Father, we pray for our political situation, and not only here, but across on the mainland. We realize the lack of political direction in this country over the past couple of years where things have suffered with regard to schools, infrastructure, agriculture, and especially health. And we pray especially tonight, Father, for those waiting lists in hospitals which keep extending day by day. We think especially tonight of those who have been diagnosed with cancer. And we know that 55% of people who have been diagnosed, unfortunately, don't get their treatment within, start of their treatment within 62 days. So we pray for our health trusts. We pray for those who have authority. And we pray, Father, that these lists will improve. We think especially of David Conkey in that area, in the cancer center in the city. We pray for our other medics here in Bloomfield and thank you for them and commit them to your grace and mercy and thank you for their skills and abilities. Father, we commit to you the politicians at Westminster and the debacle and the disgraceful scenes that we have witnessed in recent days with regard to Brexit and other issues. And we pray, Father, that those MPs will 
realize and come to their senses and know that you are still Lord of Lords and King of Kings and that you are in control. We pray for the sinister elements and people who are being destructive. We think especially of Jess Phillips, the Labour MP who has been threatened in the same way as Joe Cox was and ultimately Joe Cox being murdered. So we pray for protection for those MPs who are under threat and who seek to go about their work for their constituents. We pray for our own province and the implications of Brexit with regard to criminality and other activity on, in border areas. And we pray especially for the cooperation between the police service of Northern Ireland and the Garda Sukana. Praying especially for Chief Constable Simon Bryan and Garda Commissioner Drew Harris. Lord, we also remember this evening those who have been made redundant that Frank prayed for this morning, especially in Wright Bus and Caterpillar and others that we have heard of who have lost employment this week. I, perhaps we can't say we understand because we haven't stood in their shoes. But we pray for them and their families. And above all, we pray that as brothers and sisters in the Lord, that we will have a concern for the mental well-being of all those people who have been affected. Our Father, we also pray for uh, the relief that we heard about this morning through our own denomination with regard to Malawi and Zimbabwe and Mozambique. And we thank you for the assistance of the moderator's appeal and the difference that it has made already. And we do pray for other conflicts and situations throughout our world where Christian organizations and agencies are working to bring relief and help and support to those especially in need. We think of non-governmental organizations where many Christians are involved uh, at top level government and the difference that they can make, not only with regard to their knowledge and skills, but with regard to their Christian witness. We pray for Frank tonight as he brings your word to us. We pray that it will be relevant, that it will come by the power of the spirit, that he will hide behind your word and we will see Jesus. We thank you for the words we have just sang a moment or two ago. We thank you for the relevance of them. We thank you that our trust and our hope is in Christ and in Christ alone. And if there's difficulties this week and if there's storms, we know, Father, that our anchor holds within your veil. So at the beginning of a new week, we pray that we will realize again that peace and peace in our hearts and souls is a gift from God. And though Satan might tempt us this week, we pray, Father, that you will have the victory. We pray that we will put our sins, all of them, and nail them to the cross because it's there that they will be forgiven. So as we continue in your presence, we will leave and we will say, it is well, it is well with my soul. The reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 11 and ending at verse 25. You'll find the reading on page 1218 of the Pew Bibles. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. 
Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honour the king. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the strain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you are called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we may die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Well now, if you want, want to turn to 1 Peter 2, uh, I'm going to ask Jacob, would you be good enough to let your grandpa out uh, for a wee minute? Because I want him to come up to the front, uh, just have a, a brief conversation with him. Because um, um, Grandpa uh, Clifford is going to Scotland this coming week to Carrock Castle. Um, and this isn't the first time, Clifford, you've done this. But uh, it would be lovely if we were able just to pray with you before you do that. Tell us about your ministry there and how long you've been involved and what it entails. Uh, some years ago, I was invited to join the Kilrava Christian Trust, and I said, you people know absolutely nothing about me. I'm not joining. So they came back a second time, and they said, we want you to join the Kilrava Christian Trust, and I said, you know absolutely nothing about me. I'm not joining. And then the Lord spoke to me, and um, I joined the Kilrava Christian Trust, and it turned out to be a nightmare world. And it continues to be a nightmare world. But the reason why they had asked me, of all people, to join their trust was, amazingly, these people own Devonish Island in lockdown. And so I've been involved in that situation as well. Okay, but well, tell us specifically about what you're going to do. And you are under strict instructions because I'm preaching tonight. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> So there's a golden thread running through this nightmare, which is called Kildeen Discipling Course, and it's a ministry to ex-offenders who have found the Lord Jesus Christ in jail. Drug addicts, gangsters, all kinds of people, the kind of people I roam around with regularly. <laughs> and uh, it's just been a wonderful experience hearing the testimonies of men that have found Jesus Christ in the most remarkable circumstances, and it's a thrill to go and I make the porridge, and occasionally I lead the prayers. Okay. And you're going with Neil Groom this week? I'm going with Neil Groom this week. For how many days? It's just a long weekend for five nights. All right. We're going to pray for you. Dear Lord, we've just been singing that your word sets us free. And um, uh, Karak is a very fine example of just that. But dear Lord, we want to pray for Clifford and for Neil as they go this week and engage in this frontline ministry, that they will know your strength, your blessing, your enabling, and may they be able to return with stories of your goodness and your power at work in hearts and lives. In Jesus' strong name, amen. The teaching on Nehemiah has meant so much because the place I go to has tumbled down and we're rebuilding the walls. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad Nehemiah has blessed you because tonight we're on First Peter. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, strangely enough, the uh, two elements come together very, very well. And uh, we've noticed some great parallels between Nehemiah in the morning and First Peter at night. Well, am I right in contending that while we may not have agreed with him in the past, while it was uh, um, easier to respect the office of the President of the United States 
and the premiership of the United Kingdom. It was easier to do that in the past. Would you agree that that was the case? And I think we have to say that this last week is yet another low in both the words and behavior of Donald Trump and Boris Johnson. And yet tonight we read these words in 1 Peter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether uh, to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. Dear Lord, however inconvenient, your word is always relevant. And as we turn now to this scripture, it is our prayer that you will communicate with with us in such a way that our lives and our behavior will be conformed to the image of your son and that we may follow in his steps for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I wonder how many of you heard the word uh, prorogue before a couple of weeks ago. I had never heard the word in my life. The Supreme Court ruled that the Prime Minister's advice to the Queen to discontinue Parliament was unlawful, Meanwhile, closer to home, uh, Stormont remains prorogued, or whatever is the appropriate term, mothballed maybe, um, but by mutual agreement. And uh, we come to 1 Peter chapter 2 that says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted by God. Now, I want you to imagine, if you will, that after the next general election, Her Majesty the Queen dies and is succeeded by King Charles III. Imagine if Boris Johnson is defeated and replaced by Jeremy Corbyn. Or if Scotland holds another referendum and becomes independent. Imagine if Sinn Féin win the largest number of votes here in Northern Ireland and Michelle O'Neill becomes First Minister, and all that before a border poll. And none of these things are beyond the bounds of possibility. And at that stage, again, we read these words in 1 Peter 2.13, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake, to every authority instituted by God. How might we feel? I think it's easy enough for us to concur with God's word when everything around us is reasonably to our liking, sort of in keeping with the way of our thinking far, far more demanding when the political climate is altogether more hostile, far less agreeable. And yet, that is precisely the sort of context into which Peter wrote to these benighted believers scattered across Asia Minor. At that time, the emperor aggressively claimed divine status, and that, of course, was in direct opposition to the conviction of followers of Jesus. And many believers, you see in chapter 4, 12 through to 19, were experiencing painful trials and all kinds of suffering. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake, First Peter says, to every authority instituted among men. Well, you might ask, is that scripture uh, uh, absolutely absolute? Are we always, always to submit to the government or are there any exceptions? If we were living, for example, in Germany in the 1930s with the rise of Hitler and the Nazis, uh, are Christian people called then in those circumstances to submit? Well, Scripture does give us some guidance about that. And while this teaching in 1 Peter is very clear 
as indeed is Romans 13, it would seem that the exception to this injunction is when the state violates the command of God to choose between allegiance to him, to God, and to the state. So, for example, if we were to look at a story from Exodus chapter 1, there the midwives were commanded to kill the newborn infants of the Hebrew people with no opt-out clause. And those brave women had to say, we can't do that. If there's a choice between obeying Pharaoh and God, we have to choose God. And of course, by doing so, they made themselves vulnerable to suffer consequences. Or Daniel chapter 3, the king at that time said, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, I'm sorry, your majesty, but we can't do it. And they, as you know, were prepared to suffer the consequences of that decision. Or Daniel chapter 6, you're not allowed to pray to any god or any man except King Darius, not even in the privacy of your own home. And in that situation, Daniel chose the way of God rather than the king and was prepared to be thrown to the lions rather than agree. Or move forward into the New Testament, uh, to Acts chapter 5. And you remember the apostles were told by the Sanhedrin, we gave you strict orders not to teach in Jesus' name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And Peter, Peter who wrote this epistle, and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. And for that, they Two were prepared to suffer for their decision and take the consequences of their actions. If the state violates the commands of God to choose between him and its authority, then that is a time when Christians are permitted to violate this command uh, that we find here in 1 Peter 2, to submit to every authority. And that's why, for example, Bonhoeffer was prepared to contend against Hitler and uh, um, in turn pay the price and suffer the consequences for his decision. But apart from stark occasions such as those, here in this letter we have Peter, who knew firsthand what it was to experience the wrath of the authorities Nonetheless, using a very strong word. You see it in verse 13. Submit. And then again in verse 18, submit. And chapter 3, verse 1, submit for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. Why? Well, there's a very compelling reason which we can see in the preceding verses. And this is actually pretty stark. We're to submit to the authorities of the day, Peter says, because we are reminded that we're actually aliens and strangers in this world, verse 11. When a couple of years ago, uh, we went to see our son Robbie in the United States, we arrived at Washington Airport and there was a sign that said, aliens this way. And it wasn't referring to people who'd landed from a foreign planet, but to those of us who quite simply were from a foreign country, those who did not belong as residents. For a very long time, some would say from the fourth century on until fairly recently, here we have enjoyed living under what is known as Christendom. While not everybody by any stretch of the imagine would have called themselves Christian, the Western Hemisphere could broadly be described as culturally Christian. Christianity had a strong impact upon marriage and family, education, the humanities, science, medicine, and the political and social uh, economy and the arts. And I think we would have to say that's pretty much 
no more. While not actually promoted in times past, it did your CV no harm to at least claim adherence to the Christian church, now no longer. And these people to whom Peter was writing in the first century understood that. They had no illusions about holding positions of power or influence. Certainly not because of their faith. And for that reason, they were prepared to hold lightly to social or economic advancement because they knew themselves to be strangers, aliens in this world. Now, how are we adapting, I wonder, to being aliens and strangers in the world we now inhabit? It's, it's fairly uncomfortable stuff. But actually, contends the Apostle Peter, we don't need to feel the draft. Why? Because while the natural human desire is to want to fit in, to be comfortable, to merge in with the majority of other people. Those who belong to Jesus, those who give number one allegiance to him, verse nine, are not just aliens and strangers, but are also a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Christian people are not bothered because God's people have another nation state and belong to another kingdom. Have you ever been in an environment where you don't quite fit in? Maybe you want to, but no matter how much you uh, really would like to and try, no matter how hard you find it's impossible. You want to fit in, but the truth is you're different and you don't feel at home. I'm sure we've all been in a situation like that. Uh, maybe you've been at a nightclub and although all your friends seem at home in that environment, there's something deep inside you that is ill at ease. It's like being a ranger supporter in the middle of a Celtic crowd. Well, says Peter, stop trying to feel you have to conform. Quit attempting to imagine that as a Christian, you have to fit in. You don't have to. You don't have to feel an outsider. You don't have to uh, feel you have to be part of those who are in the know. You don't have to be under that pressure to be like everybody else. Because 1 Peter 2.9 tells us that we actually belong to another community. Our citizenship is not here. In fact, we're not meant to feel comfortable. It was never intended that we were to feel entirely at home in this world. Because unlike those who do not know the healing that comes through Christ's atoning death in verse 24, we as chosen people are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, enabling us to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. He is our king. Jesus is our ultimate authority. Now, if that is the case, and it is, if you and me don't fit into this anti-Christian, secular, immoral, and atheistic state, society, and if we're not meant to, and if you and me will never be accepted by those among whom we live and move, perhaps then we should simply withdraw, keep ourselves to ourselves, retreat into the seclusion of the safety of our own shells. That would be very tempting to feel that way. But Peter actually says in verse two, no, not at all. You don't withdraw. 
Live such good lives among the pagans, he says, by your actions and interactions with society. Live such clean and pure and godly lives among the unbelievers that although they may indeed accuse you of doing wrong, which they will, or accuse you of being moralistic or phobic or dangerous or whatever else, you are to live such good, straightforward, transparent lives that they will see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. This is radical stuff. Having reminded these scattered strangers what their identity is in, to whom they belong, these Christians are then actually liberated in order to live good and godly lives of love and service to the community. Now, I'm going to try and unpack this just a little, although you may feel that I'm being provocative. Take our present political situation here in Northern Ireland. Because of the failure of our MLAs to govern, And in the absence of a local assembly, legislation on abortion and same-sex marriage is to be imposed from Westminster unless, that is, our politicians reconvene before the 21st of October. How do Christians make their voices heard? How ought believers make our opinions known? Well, we do what those in favor of both of those things do. We go on marches, we lobby our MPs, and write postcards to the press, yes? Well, certainly Christians have as much right to do all those things as advocates of change. We are free to do that. But... Christians have another way of expressing their angst that is not available to our opponents. To illustrate what I'm trying to say, I wonder if we can put our minds into a situation well known to you in the early church, long before Christendom. In Acts chapter 12, King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. We can read it in Acts 12, verse 2. Herod held James, that's the brother of John, and he put him to death by the sword. When he saw that that pleased the indigenous population, he then proceeded to seize Peter also. Peter. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to the guards, 16 soldiers, four squads of four soldiers each, So Peter was kept in prison, but in verse 5, the church organized a rally and marched to the palace steps and organized a large petition. Well, actually, what verse 5 tells us is that the church was earnestly praying to God for him. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3, Paul says, For although we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And this is where we tie in with this morning. We were reminded from Nehemiah 4 And Ephesians chapter 6, that the battles we face are not against flesh and blood, and the chief weapons which are at our disposal, according to Ephesians 6, in the battle against those strongholds are spiritual weapons of God's word and of prayer in the spirit. So back then to Acts chapter 12. While Peter was in prison, guarded by 16 soldiers, the church was waging war. 
not out of a sense of entitlement, not out of a position of strength, but out of submission, submission to God. They were earnestly praying to the Lord for Peter. And what happened next? Well, the night before Herod was about to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound to them with two chains, and the sentries stood guard at the entrance of the jail when suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared. God's messenger struck Peter on the side and woke him up and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off Peter's wrists and Peter walked out free. Now, it is a stunning story. Because here we see the church doing what the church is meant to to do in a manner it is meant to do it. Uh, And here I'm going to be very careful how I put this. Rather than the church trying to win spiritual battles using worldly methods, the church is to, to fight spiritual battles using spiritual methods. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Christians don't have rights. I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't lobby or make their voices heard. I was on that silent march at Stormont. But let's not put our hope in them. We have another way we are to exercise the rights we have according to the ways and the means given in Scripture. And if that means prayer and leaving, leading godly lives, verse 12, and doing good, verse 15, and submitting with respect rather than fighting with disrespect, then maybe, just maybe, we're a bit closer to the heart the mind of God. Talking of which, verse 21, how did the Lord Jesus fight opposition? What did Jesus do when evil people imposed their devilish, atheistic insults his way? 1 Peter 2, verse 23, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. That's what he did. He was prepared to leave it to God, his loving Heavenly Father, and take the consequences. And if that is what Jesus did, that is the example, verse 21, which has been given to us to follow, the way of submission. Well, you say that was Jesus' way. I don't much like that. And it's not the way I would ever follow. But you see, on our own, we don't want to. And in our own strength, we are unable to. that's why Jesus has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. And that's why in verse 24, he has actually borne our sin in his body on the tree so that we might be able to do what otherwise we could never, ever manage to do, to die to our sins and live for righteousness. The scriptures tell us to submit for the Lord's sake, to the governing authorities, to our bosses, and as we'll see again, to our spouses, not because we have to, but because it's Christ's way. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waking, looking above, 
filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Father God, thank you that when you require us to fight spiritual battles, you also give us spiritual weapons with which to fight them. And so as we go into this coming week, will you enable us, please, to be armed with spiritual weapons for spiritual battles and to hide behind our Savior in whose name we pray. The grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.